In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, uh, the Apostle Paul makes this very powerful statement. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, even if our gospel is covered in some way, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, he says, the God of this world, that is the prince of the power of the air, the evil one, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Unable to see, blind to the light of the gospel. The scriptures, particularly, we see it in the gospel of John as we continue in these great I am statements, the second I am statement this morning, will use uh, concepts and pictures like darkness and light blindness and seeing as metaphors to communicate a spiritual reality. Reality, a a spiritual world. We think of the psalmist. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Feet and and path, a light lamp. They're metaphors to communicate how the word enables us to see, to live rightly after the Lord. We might even think of our physical eyes, how amazing uh, that the physical eye is as a part of the human body, a part of God's uh, creation. I've been reading through one uh, particular book highlighting different aspects of God's uh, creation. And when it came to the physical eye, one physician said this, the eye is made up of three coats which enclose the optically clear aqueous humor lens and vitreous body. The outermost coat consists of the cornea and the sclera. The middle coat contains the main blood supply to the eye and consists from the back forward of the choroid, the ciliar body, and the iris. Now, if you're like me, you don't understand much of what is there. That's okay. Uh, But the human eye is complex. The human eye is, is amazing. It's an incredible, complex creation that God has made. Uh, I'm amazed and have often been amazed by uh, the ability of the eye, how the eye can look down on a, a page and, and focus immediately on a word or a mark. Right? And then it can look up and still immediately zoom right on out and remain focused. You might need glasses, uh, but still an amazing thing, particularly when it comes to uh, sports, how an athlete can see a 90 mile per hour pitch or faster And in a split moment, see it, keep focused on it, swing the bat, and make contact. Or a quarterback can see the wide receiver in route and know how far, how fast to throw that ball to hit the chest of the receiver. It's really amazing, and the human eye is a part of that. Well, as impressive as the human eye is, and it is impressive, there is another set of eyes. There's another set of lenses that are required to see what is of greatest worth in in all of God's creation, in all of the world, to see that which is necessary in order to have real life, the kind of life that the scripture offers, uh, the the life that Jesus will speak about in next week's uh, uh, I am statement, where where he promises abundant, full, eternal life. Paul prays for this to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1, well-known words. He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Uh, To that end, we... Consider John chapter 8. So if you haven't turned there, if you would turn to John 8, this is the second I am, well-known I am statement. And it has very much to do with light and sight. Beginning at verse 12, we'll read uh, through verse 30. John 8, 12. Let's give our attention to God's word. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me 
will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it's not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I'm the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury of the temple as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below, I am from above, you're of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. One of the striking features about this text is not only the claim, which we will give certainly attention to, the claim that Christ makes, but despite so much of the text being this kind of tense exchange, Jesus having to defend himself, explain things, uh, in, in response to the Pharisees pressing him. Despite that, it ends with very good news there in verse 30. It says, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. And this, is, of course, is the very purpose for which John is writing his gospel toward the end of the gospel. Uh, familiar words to many of us. John states in chapter 20, verse 30, that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, not written or recorded in this book or gospel, but these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life uh, in his name. The emphasis there upon life again. Uh, unlike the first I am statement which we looked at last week, I am the bread of life, which came right off of a miracle, the feeding of the multitudes, this I am statement has no sign of the miraculous or supernatural, and yet many come to faith. It's not the miraculous that brings people ultimately to faith, seeing that. This is precisely what the scripture says as to how people come to saving faith uh, in the Lord Jesus, in Romans 10, faith comes by hearing, and that through the word uh, of Christ. Well, the claim that Jesus makes is not only astonishing as he associates or identifies himself as uh, the I am, ego a me, uh, claiming God's divine name, hearkening back to, to Exodus 3, God's self-revelation to, to Moses, Yahweh, I am. But then he further claims to be the light of the world. And the words in English, the, the definite articles, as well as in the Greek, the definite articles, are very important. He says, I am the light of the world. It's not a light. 
amidst other lights in the world. And it's not a light in some portion of the world. He's the light of the world. And so Jesus is, in a way, preempting all other self-claimed lights or worldviews or ways of getting to know ultimate reality. How is the world the way the world is? So that he is the light is certainly an exclusive claim. And through the Gospels, Jesus has taught on about most every topic, from money to relationships, from ambitions in our lives to life purpose, destiny, death itself. So it's not one light among numerous lights, as many in our culture would want it to be. But indeed, there's a very strong inclusive perspective or emphasis. I'm the light of the world. It's drawing us back to some of the prophecy, the nations, my salvation to the ends of the earth. Christ is the light for all peoples, for all uh, the nations. And yet we know the world, as we heard from 2 Corinthians 4, the, the world is, is blind to that light. Which is why at, at times, or often perhaps in our lives, we, we might feel the world's kind of indifference or even coldness. Not, not wanting anything to do with the Christian faith or, or claims. Not interested. Just uh, days ago, while here at the church in, in my office reading, studying, uh, the phone rang. Being the only one here at the time, I, I picked it up and uh, the words on the other end were, is this Brad? And if you don't know, my predecessor's name is Brad, Pastor Brad Evans. I'm sure that's who he was looking for. I said, no, this is Will. They said, well, is there a manager or CEO or owner? Now, at that point, I was pretty sure they're thinking this is a general business that happens, right? Some, some business of some kind. I said, no, this is a church. I'm a pastor. Next words. Have a great day, sir. <laughs> Couldn't even have a chance to get him there, uh, have a conversation. So I thought, whatever they were selling, whatever they were wanting, they were not wanting a church. They were not wanting a pastor, uh, we might feel that way at times as, as Christians. I know it, it has happened to me at coffee shops from time to time. I'll be reading. I'll have my Bible open, and, and I'll see someone come in, and they'll take a look. They'll look at it and do a, a double take. And what, what is that? It looks like a really old book. It is an old book. It's a really old book. It's almost like something just out of the world or ancient to people. Uh, the world in which we live is filled with people, as Jesus says, walking in darkness. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, implying that those who are not following Christ, those who are not with Christ, are in some kind of uh, darkness. David Wells, in his great work called No Place for Truth, or Whatever Happened to Evangelical Theology, uh, writes this. He says, as this fragmentation has progressed, the kind of fragmentation morally uh, in our society, both in culture and in Christian faith, and the center has given way, one might think that people would believe in less and less. But the reverse has happened. A culture for whom God is no longer present believes everything. Who would have imagined that as we became more and more technologically oriented, for example, millions of people would also become more and more devoted to astrology, directing their lives by what the planets were doing. Who would have expected that some of the most secularized cities, such as L.A. and Amsterdam, would become hosts to a growing array of bizarre cults, many of which reek of primitive superstition? Who would have thought that after two awful world wars and many subsequent conflicts, Western thought would still be indulging in the myth of inevitable progress with a devotion that makes most believers look like pikers withdrawing. When we believe in nothing, we open the doors to believing anything. 
Uh, we, don't, we don't need a light to follow. We've, we have human progress. We have industry. We have modernization. That's the answer to our problems. Uh, J.C. Ryle, the great 19th century Anglican pastor uh, and bishop, notes this on Jesus' claim there in, in John 8. Jesus' words imply that the world needs light and is naturally in a dark condition. Uh, this is part of what the church is fighting for today, or fighting in the midst of. Uh, not personal betterment or more achievement or being a nice neighbor. We probably could be nicer neighbors, but that's not the ultimate fight. It's, it's really a transformation, this radical change from darkness to light. Uh, man's condition, naturally, it's not like getting up in the middle of the night. You need to use the restroom and your eyes are adjusting, but you can still make things out, right? You might stub your toe on the way. This is pitch darkness, pitch darkness. The eyes do not adjust. If you've ever been in pitch darkness, they don't adjust there. And there's a condition that Jesus lays out. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This is similar to other I am statements. There's a condition. I'm the bread of life. Whoever believes will not hunger. I'm the true vine. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. Whoever follows. And following here seems to be synonymous with believing. Biblical faith is not mere assent. We could jump right back into uh, the, the work and the, uh, the words of James. You believe, good, but even the demons believe. They understand things that are true. But this is a belief that trusts, that you know, believes into and rests one's life upon. And then what's the promise? They will not walk in darkness. Those following Christ, they will have the light of life. Meaning, perhaps they'll have the light, who is Christ in their lives... And the light, Christ, will give life. Knowledge of who God is, the forgiveness of sins, the reconciliation to our Heavenly Father, a growing hope and assurance that this one who began a good work will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. That kind of fullness of life and eternal life. Our Lord's words here are not only powerful, just standing alone, but they're all the more striking given the context in which Jesus speaks them. One of the ways that uh, John's gospel is constructed, we've seen that one of those ways is the emphasis on the use of the language of, of the signs from chapter 2 uh, to 11. Jesus performing these miracles and, and John commenting, this was the first sign, uh, pointing to who Jesus is as the Messiah. And indeed, another construct is the I am statements from chapter uh, 6 to 15. But another is that through the reading of God, John's gospel, unlike the synoptics of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are the disciples and Jesus traveling uh, again and again to, the, to Jerusalem for the great feasts of Israel. The feast of Passover, uh, the feast of uh, harvest, and the feast of booths or tabernacles. And that's part of what we have happening. So in chapter 7, the previous chapter, verse 2, we're told the Feast of Tabernacles or of Booths was taking place. That the disciples had gone into Jerusalem. Jesus, we're told, stayed back. But then he later went on his own into the city. This was a, was a feast in Exodus 23 and Leviticus 23 in which the people of God and the families that made up Israel were to construct out of wood and branches a small booth, a small tabernacle on an annual basis for a week-long celebration to commemorate God's tabernacling, boothing, being with his people in the wilderness. So it's very much about the presence of God with his people, recalling how the Lord led them by a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, the brightness of God his dwelling with them. Jesus enters Jerusalem for this feast or the tail end of it. He goes into the temple, we're told, and he begins to preach. 
they're, they're astonished by what he knows. They're wondering how he knows so much, not having formal uh, training in, in their mind. And where he stands, which we're told in our text in verse 20, is the treasury, likely adjacent to the court of the women. So we're in, in the temple construct here. And in this place would be several menorahs, lampstands, lighting up the whole area. In fact, some suggest that, that the lamps were so large, young priests would periodically climb up the long ladders with pitchers of olive oil and refill the bowls. And so there's the picture. The lamps are lighting up the whole area. They're celebrating and remembering God's divine presence. And then Jesus makes this profound statement. I am the light. Not only here, I am the light of the whole world. My word, my presence, my spirit uh, will extend to the nations. Indeed, that's why we're gathered here as God's people. And the same question comes to any who hear Jesus' claim. Are my eyes open to the light? Has the light dawned in my life? Is his light guiding me? Am I following? Am I a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? The response is a mixed one. We noted in verse 30 there, many believe, but there are many who question and argue and oppose, represented by the Pharisees. Maybe that's understandable. Verse 13, the Pharisees say, you're bearing witness about yourself, your testimony is not true. Anyone can make claims. And then what follows is an explanation uh, from Jesus regarding an all-important question. And the question is, on what authority, this, qu this question comes to us, on what authority, what basis can Jesus make such claims? On what basis can Christianity be true? How would you respond? It's not that evidence doesn't uh, play a part. I think here in John's Gospel of doubting Thomas. You remember his story that comes uh, chapters later after Jesus' resurrection. We call him doubting Thomas. He, he wouldn't believe he had doubts unless he could see the marks in the risen Lord on his hands and feet. And Jesus' response is not merely just believe. He does say, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. But no, he, he comes to Thomas and he shows him his hands and he shows him his feet. He says, put your hands there. Look, see. Likewise, we read of Paul in Acts 17 while he's in Athens we're told reasoning with the Jews and in the marketplace day by day. Reasoning with those around him. So sure, reason and evidence have their place. But, but it seems to me beneath that is an even greater foundation. It's really what Jesus seems to be appealing to in his claim. Verse 18 and 19. I'm the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. And to 19, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. Continuing on in 23, you, you are from below, I am from above. You're of this world, I am not of this world. And then 28 and 29. I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing uh, to him. It, it seems that it is divine revelation. Jesus stakes his claim in the nature of his relationship to his heavenly Father. One can reject, and many do, the claims of Christ, or they can consider them sort of lunacy. But the believer's faith, our faith rests upon God's divine revelation by the working of His Spirit and the proclamation of the gospel. Remember 
Jesus' words to, to Peter when Peter professed Jesus as the Christ. You are the Christ. And Jesus responds, Blessed are you, Peter, for this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. There's those from above and those from below. There's those of this world. There's those redeemed from this world. Those whose Father is God and those still defined by their sin, uh, old nature. We read it, we heard it read earlier in the New Testament reading. This is how John begins his gospel there in chapter 1, verse 9. The, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people. His own people didn't receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. The issue is whether the eyes of one's hearts have been made to see. Just last week at Presbytery, I was reminded uh, of this brief illustration or picture Two young fish are swimming along in the ocean, and an older fish swimming in the opposite direction swims by, nods his head, and says, Morning, boys. How's the water? The two young fish continue swimming for a bit, and then one turns to the other and says, How's the water? What in the world is water? Sometimes the environment in which we are living or swimming is so pervasive, right? So defining of my thinking and way of life, I just don't really see it. I don't realize what I'm swimming in. Could be material consumption as the fulfillment in life or a zeal for power, position, or wealth that can so define a society Maybe it's rarely opening the scriptures or sitting quietly with, with my heart open before God. Uh, complacency has just become uh, the water in which I swim, my norm. Or independence, self-reliance, the, the effort to need no one. Innumerable are the worldly sort of values that can uh, take up residence in our hearts. We can be unaware. This is a, a text that is about light, the light of Christ and sight, our eyes being opened. Perhaps as powerful as anything are Christ's words in verse 24 and 28. 24, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, literally, unless you believe I am there's another I am statement. That's what it is. Then you will die in your sins. And then 28. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. Again, it is I am. You will know I am. That language when the Son of Man is, is lifted up, that's, the, that's language for the cross of Christ and his resurrection. And indeed, it is the cross and resurrection of Christ, which is the dividing line, how, how one responds to who Christ is and what he has done that is going to be determining their eternal destiny. And how counterintuitive it is that the light shines brightest near the cross, near that man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Even in our lives, when things may appear very dark to us, uh, Christ is with us. His light pierces through uh, the darkness. As we sang... Jesus, I do now receive him. More than all in him I find. He has granted me forgiveness. I am his and he is mine. Hallelujah, what a savior. Hallelujah, what a friend.
saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, how we thank you. Lord Jesus, how we thank you and praise you for who you are, uh, for your powerful uh, grace that pierces our hearts and uh, causes the eyes of our hearts to be enlightened. Uh, Indeed, Christ, you are the true enlightenment. Makes us to see um, the way the world is, our need, Lord, for you, uh, our guilt, our condemnation apart from your intervening work and how we praise you lord for the cross of jesus christ Um, nothing in my hands i bring only to the cross of christ i cling that we would know that we have been crucified with christ the old person put to death and that those who are in christ are new creations lord shed the light of your your grace upon your people Open more and more our eyes that we can behold your goodness and power. That We can follow after you, Lord, faithfully and joyfully. We pray all these things with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.